obsession, you gotta be a junkie of something, right? Uh, I remember tweaking the typography of the website. So yeah, Simon the, told me you gotta stop. If this yeah, is stop. yeah, we would get in arguments because uh, I would be spending like literally months on our on our marketing site, and I'd be like, oh, we gotta, you know, we gotta work on the product. Oh, no. And then we get in arguments like, oh, it's not quite ready yet. Yeah. Ivan is always the one to be, you know, thinking it's not quite ready and still needs a few more touches. And, uh, I, I'm pretty obsessive too, although typically in our dynamic, I was often the one that You're was like, more like, like pushing more to be like, okay, it's, it's good enough, let's just, let's get it out. Welcome to First Block, a Notion series where founders and executives from the world's leading companies tell us what it was like to navigate the many firsts of their startup journey and what they learned from that experience. I'm Akshay Kothari, Notion's co-founder and COO. Throughout the season of First Block, we've had amazing guests from some of the fastest growing companies out there. Today, we're doing something a little different. I'm excited to sit down with my co-founders, Ivan and Simon, to give you a peek behind the curtain here at Notion. Welcome to the final episode of uh, the first season of First Block. We've had some amazing entrepreneurs, and I'm so excited to wrap this season with Ivan and Simon, my co-founders at Notion. Thank you for making the time today. Yeah. Thanks. All right, I'm going to usually start with Ivan, but I'm going to start with Simon today. Simon. Uh, Tell us your part of the Notion story. I guess, how did you meet Ivan? How did you get here? Yeah, I had uh, just turned 20 at the time, and I, uh, I just finished my second year of college, and I came out to California for an internship uh, for the summer. Um, it, it, was my, it was my first time on the West Coast. I found on Twitter some, some people that I, uh, that I was interested in talking to and ended up uh, reaching out to, to, to uh, Toby Shockman, who was working with Ivan. Um, and I, I arranged to meet Toby, thinking it was just going to be Toby, but then, then Ivan shows up and is also there. I didn't know uh, who this guy is. And then, uh, yeah, uh, I started trying to recruit me to, to, to join them in this, this new project that they just started. And um, yeah, within a couple hours, I had been, been convinced enough to, um, to, to quit the internship. And uh, the next day, I moved out of my apartment in uh, a Palo Alto and took the Caltrain up to uh, 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 the office at the time in the mission. And I lived up there for the rest of the summer. And yeah, kind of the rest is history since then. I've been, been working with Ivan ever since. I think from your perspective, like you, you showed up at the first meeting and started pitching. What gave you the conviction to basically go hire this Simon? I, you know, a lot of people are Twitter famous. And, like, uh, and Twitter famous, they have a portfolio. Simon has a portfolio, great portfolio. He, he built a lot of game, built a lot of things in this kind of tools for thought space, but he's not Twitter famous. And this is like, oh, who is this kid, right? So like, like clearly talented. Uh, then we met up, then it feels like, wow, we think this very similar, think a lot about uh, tools, think about visual programming languages, alternative way to use your computers. So I think a lot about kids education system for kids, uh, then feels like this is the right person we start working together, right? And he's so young at the time. He's like under drinking age. And uh, remember the old office next by the trade dock in the mission. And uh, uh, we couldn't get in because Simon's under drinking age, but trade dock shared the bathroom with the restaurant next door. So we usually go to the restaurant next door, go through the uh, restroom and go into the bar trade dock. So that's how we get Sammy in, right? And uh, they're gonna have to close this loophole now. No, it's fine. <laughs> also, if I remember correctly, like because he was still in college, I think you also ended up meeting Simon's uh, yeah, cause dad, tr right? Trying to convince Simon to drop off school. It doesn't need much convincing. It's like pretty easy. And uh, I think his dad and your sister came over too, right? Uh, dad and sister came over, shook hands with the dad. It's like, I'm not a crazy person. Then, uh, yeah. So you hire Simon as an intern that summer, and then talk to me a little bit about that journey to becoming, you know, your co-founder. I think startup goes through so many ups and downs. It's a co-founder. It's not the person, not necessarily the person you you start a company on the very first day. It's the people who went through the up and downs together. Right? There's some of the darkest days, just like me and Simon just coding together, and um, and. People like that, and you and Sam going through that has to be part of the co-founder. 
Can you talk a little bit about those early years? Like, I guess it also seemed like you guys actually grew the team and then came back down to two, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit about that, like that journey where, I guess it was a time when we didn't have product market fit. Many flavors of the stories on the, on the internet, uh, the things we've been talking, uh, maybe if you ask us about that question, uh, I think people love this kind of hero's journey of return, like, right? So, um, this idea is more or less the same. Like, uh, we have this powerful thing called the computers, but only people who know how to program can get the full potential out of this medium, this tool. So how can we create better version of programming environment, better version of software, better version of productivity tools to get more power out of this for all the billions of people who use these computers every day? So that's always the theme. Um, first version of that we tried it, it's kind of like, oh, maybe the better way to get more people out of the power of programming is to create an easier programming environment, like a Webflow meets Figma. Right, where we have Vlad on the show earlier. Um, tried that for like two plus years, two, three years. Uh, learning of that is like, actually most people don't think about making software, don't think about programming their own tools. Most people just want off the shelf thing that solve their problem really quickly. That's kind of like a big aha for us, right? Like we're so mm -hmm. idealistic. It's making tools is so easy for us, so natural, but we thought other people want the same thing as you want, but no, it's like tool makers are rare in the world, right? So it's less about that, but rather more about how do we disguise a tool making power, programming power into a product that people use every day. So Notion transition more from a computing tool, programming language tool into a productivity tool. The ethos still is the same, right? So how do we, ethos still, how do we hide the computing power into uh, productivity software? That took us three, four years. Was there like a specific moment you remember where you, so it was like, aha, like we need to actually disguise it as a productivity tool. Like that's, that's like the right wedge into the market. I think it's probably just gradual. Right? We even tried stuff like the concept, remember that stuff? Yeah. I I do remember a specific moment where we had the explicit thought of like, oh, in, instead of trying to go directly at programming, let's just hide it in the tools people are already familiar with. And what's a tool that everyone uses every day, like like documents. And I think I think that was an like an explicit thought. Mm -hmm. I, I think another big thing from those early days is like, um, I think Ira Glass said like, you know, when you're early on in in your career building your expertise, right? Like you're your taste is way higher than your ability to execute. And I think that was very true for us. Like we we just weren't that good at building stuff and it was very frustrating, you know, like like, like we knew what we wanted it to look like and we wanted it to, to be. And I think, uh, yeah, we just made a lot of like technical and product mistakes. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a big reason why we had to reset and start over and, you know. Mm -hmm. We probably try like three, four times. Yeah. Three or four rewrites, right? I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think the salient thing is like, yeah not actually ever giving up and just, just keep, going. keep trying again. And uh, eventually, you know, as, as long as you're being open and learning from your mistakes, you'll eventually get, get good enough to do it. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like, Simon, you're one of, among the most positive and pragmatic people I've met. Uh, but I'm just trying to think, imagine you in those years, like you're 22, 23, things are not working, uh, company's about to lose like the funding it has, like, you know, what was going through your head? Um, yeah. in that, during that time? I think, I think Ivan and I both are very like, like kind of level people in terms of our mood. And um, yeah, I, I'm, it's very easy for me to, uh, for better or worse, it's, it's very easy for me to just get excited or obsessed about some new thing and just kind of forget all the other problems. And so maybe, you know, there were definitely some low points where, you know, we had discussions and, you know, like, like, what should we do next? You know, what can we do? But but it, it, it's so easy for us in, in our dynamic to talk about like, okay, well, what if we build this? And you know, the conversation know. quickly turns into yeah. like, like a positive one. And like the problem we're trying to solve is pretty big and kind of like impossible to fully solve. And so that's, that's a big uh, benefit because within this massive unsolvable problem, there's always 
there's always new facets to focus on and like, like new things to get excited about. And you know, it's, it's kind of endless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think obsession is pretty key. I remember like when you first joined Notion, you might have forgot you were, the Steve Jobs biography came out. It's pretty thick. Then you, you finished it in one weekend or something. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this kid is obsessed about things. And it's, like, it's like, why is your red so, eye so red? It's like, oh, I was reading the biography <laughs> the entire weekend. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. a lot of that is like, I feel like a lot of similar attributes you carry as well. Yeah. I remember when we did the values exercise, just coming up with the company values. Yeah, I did like 10 versions. I feel like you something. probably did 10 versions, but also you read like 100 different books of like other companies' values. Mm -hmm. It seems yeah. like both of you kind of go deep. Obsession, you got to be a junkie of something, right? So, I remember tweaking the typography of the website. Yeah, Simon the, told me, you got to stop. This yeah. Is not. yeah, we would get in arguments because uh, I would be spending like literally months on our on our marketing site. And I'd be like, oh, we got you know, to work on the product. Yeah, no. And then we, we'd get in arguments like, oh, it's not quite ready yet. Yeah. Ivan is always the one to be, you know, thinking it's not quite ready and still needs a few more touches. And mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty obsessive too, although typically in our dynamic, I was, Often the one that yeah, was like, more like, like pushing more to be like, okay, it's it's good enough. Let's just let's get it out. Yeah. Um, True. Sure. So, I remember in my first yeah. few weeks when I joined, I think Ivan was working on a tweet storm for relations. You remember that? Like we had ten tweets, mm. uh, and I think oh, I Ivan remember spent that. like all of two days just working on the tweet storm. Yeah, right, this right. is a good tweet storm. It's about <laughs> the history of relational database, starting from like Larry IBM Ellison. paper to Larry Ellison and yeah. how they made Oracle because the paper from yeah. IBM, right? So your little uh, Adam Curtis documentary. I know, people should, I still think that's good, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, I guess like uh, 2016, 2017, we have this early version of Notion that's starting to hit product market fit. Um, uh, I think a lot of founders go through this, right? Like this journey before they get there. Like, I guess as you all started to see a little bit of a pull from market, can you talk a little bit about like how we found our first customers, like how we stayed close to them. I think sort of go back to what Simon was saying. It's maybe it's less about the word of finding. It's more about the word of executing to something you know you taste is there. You know you can build a better productivity tool, better programming tool, better text editor. It's just really hard to get there, right? There's people been building, building text editor for three, four decades but you know you can build a better one. So it took us many tries there. So, and you're confident that once you get there, it's a better thing, right? People, some people will realize that. And, and I think that's the thing we we'll just keep repeating, repeating notion. It's a you know, good document knowledge pro, like thing backed by a like graph data structure is buildable. Um, so once you build that, you can see all oh, people actually coming for it. People have discovered the value that we try to inject into the world and launch on things like Pradahan, um, which is actually the first place that we pushed the 1.0 out. And, uh, and from there, talking with people on Pradahan, talking to people in support tools, we realize actually they find true value out of this, right? And they, real, real, they have similar tastes as uh, our taste. And, uh, so it wouldn't say we fun, stumble upon it. It just realized, it feels like we finally can execute to the level that our taste is there. Yeah. Like yeah. the need was already there, but we got to meeting their needs. Yeah, a better mousetrap, right? Yeah. Mousetrap is useful. People know what mousetrap is. Can you build a better one? Yeah. I think like not, not all companies can do this, but we definitely, uh, we definitely have, which is like, if you can, it's better to build for yourself at, at first. Like, like you're the person designing and using it as you're building it. And I think to this day, like a, a, a big percentage of it is we're building for ourselves. You know, we're trying to make a tool that we actually want to use every day. And we were the first users. Um, and then after we launched, it's kind of tacking onto that. Okay, also there's other users now. We have to you know, talk to them with customer support and mm -hmm. aggregate their feedback. And so it's kind of building from that core of like, you actually like it and you want to use it every day. And then, you know, and then over time, filling more gaps because, you know, people use it in ways that you didn't expect or understand, you know. It's pretty touching, actually. Like, remember, we we're working on support, and uh, I was and, just thinking that actually in my head. Yeah, and that. those people that you, you help solving, they give us feedback. They help troubleshoot their problems, and the moment that we launch on back in the day, product on, like, 
you read our comments, those are familiar faces, right? Yeah. The people you having help, like they help us, we troubleshoot them and support, they come support you, launch the product. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much a community feeling of just digital version of that. I think it might be worth actually talking about that time. Uh, at least when I joined, I feel like all three of us and the broader team spent so much time in support. And I feel like that was like just talking to customers every day. Uh, in many cases, I remember some fun stories where there was like a bug introduced and a support person would just walk over to Simon and Simon would fix it. And then we'd go back to the support person and be like, refresh, try it now. And it sort of like fixed it. And it's sort of like there was this early customer love and obsession that sort of was felt through the company. Yeah. And it seems like in some ways, like by the time I got there, it had already been something that you had designed, uh, thinking mm -hmm. very closely how, like what support person is doing, what an engineer is doing, and the work, the, the way that gets connected was very strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on one end, it's worth at the end of the day building a tool. Mm. Tool has to be solve people's problem. We're all human with a similar hands, similar feet. So if it doesn't feel good on other people's, hold that a little bit and feel that pain and solve it, right? And then how do you scale this when you have hundreds, not just one or two requests, but hundreds, thousands of that? Can you aggregate into something, uh, some kind of report um, using system to translate that qualitative feeling? How does this pen or hammer fit in your hand, fit in the hand into something that you can stack rank the needs because Notion, they're so open-ended, right? There's so many different requests for so many different type of people. So segmentation, aggregation, tally, great system to do that job rather than uh, you read through a thousand report, a thousand tickets to do that job. So. I just remember you you made me turn on my push notifications for intercom. Intercom, right, yeah. <laughs> like, I was just like, you'd be buzzing every three seconds with like a new customer ticket coming in and you'd be like, keep it on because that's the way you're gonna build intuition. Intuition, right? Well, you can turn yeah. off the sound. You can, One thing we did in the early days, and I still do this, so useful is we, once you aggregate, uh, all, uh, anyone working on support would, um, would actually talk to the person back and forth to try to you know dig a little bit deeper in what they wanted. It's often like a feature request or something that, that we don't have, and then all those conversations would get tagged and then aggregated. And then if we decided to to prioritize one of them, we we basically had instant extensive user research where you could just go uh, for somebody probably trying to solve, look at that tag and read like a hundred inter intercom conversations, and you've, within an hour you now pretty much deeply understand the problem you're trying to solve, and it let us just like really quickly add new add, add new features that you know, really went deep and solved people's problems, which is yeah. super useful. There was a, a feeling, and I don't know the ethos that we had around just systems building that I think runs through the company even today in many ways, which is like, you know, I think like, let's not throw people at problems. There's mm -hmm. ways that we can build better systems that, and I think when I think about these early days, like, it wasn't like we had a, you know, a product ops function which was aggregating all this feedback or a research function who was talking to all these people who have these problems. We built a system, designed it in a way because we were only 10 people that sort of got us some of those use cases without having to hire those people. It's not just Notion the company, but Notion itself, right? Yeah. What are the building blocks? Can one building blocks like Lego used by so many different things? Can you have the, you, can you try to have the, minimal number of building blocks and minimal number of interaction and communication. In some sense, collaboration is friction, right? It's, it's, you need to talk, you need to generate heat through friction, it's energy loss. So the best way is don't collaborate, think information just flow to the right, right places. And that's through better system design, finding the right primitive in, the, in whatever problem you try to solve. Uh, product try to do that. Ideally, company try to do that so you can keep the company lean. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some of this was, some of it's conceptual and some of it's also just born out of necessity of having a very small team. Yeah. Like, you just have to do more things with fewer people. Like, like within engineering, like, you know, we were only like three engineers for a very long time and, or, or less. And we were very obsessed with like, uh, when we built a new feature or added something, it had to fit in with the rest of the system. We had to build it properly the first time. Uh, because if you don't build it properly, next week you're going to you know, still be working on it. Uh, so you have to be able to 
build it properly and move on to the next thing. And, and that means like, like putting a lot of crap into it and designing the system so things interconnect pretty well. I think in the earlier personas or customers we got were a lot in, I guess what we call EPD, like engineering, product design. Uh, but in many ways, like Notion is a tool that works for all different functions. Um, in the early days, did you all think about a specific persona? Or was it more general? It's more general. I think because we are engineer product design, we build for ourselves. The block model is kind of like engineer designers thinking way of using a text editor. Like the designer has drag and drag, drag rectangle select and select multiple images that you move at the same time, right? So uh, sort of built for that. And that clicks with engineer product design who are system builders, system thinkers. Uh, yeah. But, but the aspiration has always been like, uh, I, I've, been, I've been using this word ubiquity all the time, uh, that just, you know, we are, our, our aspiration is really to any, any person be able to use it in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and even though it's a, you know, the vibe is a bit technical maybe due to our, our nature. It's, uh, we, we tend not to build features that explicitly constrain that. It's like, if anyone wants to come and use it, we, we, we welcome that. I sort of feel like a lot of startups actually face this, which is they want to build a general purpose horizontal tool. Uh, but sometimes that actually becomes a crutch for them. It's like, if you're trying to build like something general purpose for everyone, like, um, and I feel like we've actually faced a little bit of that tension mm -hmm. internally too. It's like if we start to think about every persona, every use case, it sort of makes us a little bit, like it's hard to think about what do we build next. And I wonder if both of you can talk a little bit about how we've sort of still ended up with like a general purpose tool, but internally we've used some constraints to sort of like build the right product. Our approach is typically to like when we, when we try to solve a, a new problem, our approach is typically to um, first try to deeply understand the problem, uh, the, the, the people that are, that are having this problem. Maybe you think about multiple personas and, uh, and then in, in parallel, think about the solution space, which involves breaking down the problem into its constituent like components and uh, trying to express your solution ideally as the, uh, some kind of flexible primitives that can solve your problem. And then there's a maze of trade-offs you have to navigate to connect this like, you know, the, the, the problem and the persona you're trying to solve and, the, and your primitive -y solution. And mm -hmm. it's really hard to do that, but yeah, it's just like kind of grind away at that process. And as long as you, you know, re really care about both sides of this, I think you often can arrive at solutions where you can express a primitive that's very broadly useful, but also solves like a specific problem. Mm -hmm. that, and ideally that solve two plus persona at the same time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, right. And yeah, I think you can only really do this if you're just like really obsessed with both sides and not like jumping to conclusions too early on either mm -hmm. side. Like it's easy to kind of like the, the, the PM mindset is like to jump to conclusions on the, on the persona or problem side. And then kind of the pure engineering mindset is kind of the opposite, like pure primitive, it doesn't solve a problem. And you have to kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky maze to, to navigate, but it's super worthwhile, I think, to, to try hard. So in that framework, like, which one are both of you? I feel it's like maybe Ivan is more on the PM side and then you're more on the engineering side? I think side. we're kind of similar. I think that's too simple, yeah. yeah. I, think, I, think we both, like, I think we both have parts of ourselves that are expressing both of these things. And yeah. He's kind of better at keep the system, he's more pragmatic. Uh, I'm better at connecting the dot, but he's good at connecting the dot too. So it's yeah. trade-off all the way down, right? So like on the, there's a trade-off on the UX side, like, okay, what do people recognize? Like what's normal for people? Like the best, the simplest system tend to be the one that people are most familiar with. It doesn't mean it has the fewest part, but the, but the one that people are most used to. Then that is the UX trade-off. Then you have UI trade-off, which is go to the pixel land. Right, like there's only 20 pixel or 40 pixel for you to wiggle, put your icons or text in. What do you put? Should it be an icon? Should it be a text? Like, um, should it, is it too much of something will look ugly and look busy? Then you'd make that kind of slightly smaller trade-off. 
And on the, on the more technical side, there's trade-off what's buildable, what's not buildable, and what's real-time, what's like doesn't have to be real-time. Then you knock on each of the door, then eventually hopefully find there never be a perfect solution, but will be one that's satisfied the trade-off you care about more or less the most. And then, then that's the one we go with. Uh, as, you, as you're speaking through that, it does seem like I think you, you need a little bit of a time to sort of explore that maze, figure out the right trade-off between conceptual and yeah. like what will land. Yeah, I mean, I think you need, I think what's really important is you need the freedom to not ship until you found like something good. Yeah, if, if your only constraint is time and you have to ship something by a certain time, it can be really hard to do that. Mm -hmm. but, but, as long, but as long as you can, you know, Maybe you can have a date you want to get it by, but you know, really, what you care about is getting it right, and you'll you'll push the date if you didn't get it. Uh, I think that's really mm -hmm. important. I think another key is like remove the boundary of remove the boundary of skill set and roles and the team structure. This we're just talking about the trade off design of UX of users problem of technical things. They tend to map into an engineer, a designer, a PM, right? It's really, and go back to the collaboration friction, the communication friction. It's really hard for me to dump my thinking into another designer PMs through through tech writing or talking. But it's a lot easier if you have the multiple skill set in your own head. Then you can make that trade off really, really quickly and in a very creative way that connecting the dot that separate individual person cannot do that. So, in some sense, we're trying to design our company in a similar way. So, designer who can code engineer who can think about product, right? Uh, that help break, break the boundary, move faster, and create, come up with new solutions. I definitely feel like that's sort of like scaled as we've become a larger company, is that we're less like your designer, your engineer, your PM. Like I feel like so many engineers who are PMs here and so many designers who also code and so many uh, I guess engineers who also like have this like great design sense, mm -hmm. and we we like it that it's blurry at Notion. It's I think it's blurry is good. Blurry is no. good. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk maybe next about international. It feels like we launched in Product Hunt, and like literally from day one, we've been a very global sort of company, global user base. Business is also. Um, I think maybe like I'm curious like in the early days when you saw all these people from Europe and Asia also using it, mm -hmm. um, you know how did we go about sort of supporting them, uh, and then how did we scale that to, you know, all the people that we have now around the world? Yeah, to keep your intercom notification on. I just <laughs> <laughs> I think it used to be like one minute average reply rate, right? A reply time, you didn't reply time. Uh, I feel like the first six months I joined, I was all I was doing was support. Yeah. And yeah. I felt like, oh my God, you guys have hired a very expensive person to do support. I mean, from from a technical perspective, we didn't do much in the early days. Like our product wasn't localized. Our servers are all in like uh, the West Coast, so it's like kind of slow to load it from, from another place. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's just about just trying to make a really good product and not close down the distribution. I guess like you know mm -hmm. we're we're really leaning in on like internet. Internet distribution, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone uses Product Hunt. It doesn't matter what what country you're from. Most we're, startups we're are pretty it. English speaking, so the language is less a barrier. Time zone might be, but you know, still 24 hour support is decent. Uh, also, we're so I think related is we're we're so blessed to have this incredibly passionate community of builders. Mm -hmm. um, I guess when you look back, was there a time that you really felt like, well, this is so special, what we have? Like, the fact that we have this community of people who are just crazy power users, pushing the product in ways that even we can't imagine here. Was there a event? I remember, remember that time we went to Singapore, yeah. right? <laughs> like, we're trying to go to Singapore to find, oh, where is the a a APAC of Asia office? I think you tweeted. Uh, you tweeted. I tweeted. You tweeted yeah. like in a, in a Saturday afternoon or something. Like some I think it was Saturday morning. I said, "Hey, we're here for 36 hours." Yeah. Uh, and something like 30 people showed so up. 30 people showed later. up in this yeah. like rainstorm, but yeah. it rains a lot in Singapore, anyways. So I was like, "Wow!" Did not expect that. And uh, that's generally for me, like walking into even a different city. 
and just see people going to a coffee shop and say, wow, this person is using Notion. Like, no idea. Never gets old. Never gets old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm always really blown away by the crazy setups people make. And yeah, like, I'm, I'm personally not a huge uh, productivity person. Like, I, I just, I kind of code all day and like take simple notes and have a to-do list, you know, kind of like super basic in a way. But yeah, it's always been, I've always been so blown away by the, the stuff people make and maintain and yeah, it's like super inspiring. Maybe switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, just the company culture and uh, the values we've built. Uh, we're close to 600 people now. Um, maybe start with you, Ivan. How, I guess I'm curious maybe in the early days when we were maybe 30, 40 people, we, we went down this exercise of writing our own values and it was mm -hmm. a very long process. Um, but I feel like it's one of those things that you sort of deeply cared about and went, went super deep on. Maybe talk a little bit about that exercise, but in general, how you've thought about scaling company culture. Mm -hmm. Who said this, like the uh, execution eats strategy for launch and culture eats execution for launch? And then end of the day, it's like the culture, the norms, uh, the principle of a, the intuitive principle of company, right? Uh, I think maybe you nudge me or someone like a, like in the hey, actually write it down, right? Like, Might have been Jeff Weiner. Maybe Jeff Weiner, <laughs> right? Jeff did. Um, write it down. We are twenty, thirty-ish people. Um, many great companies. They sort of they had it written it down somewhere. A lot of our internal. Um, I remember the best one is one of the best one is like IKEA's one because they had a company running for maybe twenty years, ten or twenty years. Did not write it down. Then their founder uh, wrote it down into this like, ten. 10 commandment of IKEA, I think written in the 70s. Um, and their mission statement is it's kind of in some sense similar to ours, but in the physical space, right? The better software, a better, uh, better life for the many people through, so through furniture. Amazing. Uh, Actually, another one I remember from that, that IKEA had, I think it was IKEA was uh, revenue is a resource. Revenue is right? a resource, yeah. right? Revenue is not the goal, it's the yeah. mean to the end, right? Yeah. We, st we sort of stole that, but not <laughs> in our, yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. What about you, Simon? Maybe like engineering culture <laughs> and like how we've tried to build that here? On the values, that's super interesting on that process is like, you want it to be some balance between a thing that you already are and a thing that you aspire to be and, mm -hmm. and it can't be like too much of one or the other uh, so yeah lots of lots of revs on that both for the you know for the whole company and engineering we there's definitely like a bunch of principles that we we had in the early days that i definitely sought to maintain a lot like uh one of them i uh i like to call uh, uh, tend to the garden so it's like you know if you're going and working on fixing some bug and you notice something that's like kind of confusing or it seems broken, just take a few extra minutes to go fix that thing. And you know, and if everyone's changing the garden here and there, we have a much better system as a whole. Um, uh, another one is like kind of like not having like rigid boundaries. Uh, uh, like basically anyone can edit any of the code, right? Like it's not like some other team's code that you can't edit and you have to go ask them and submit a request and then wait for two weeks or something like that, right? Yeah. I don't feel like Ownership, which is, I guess, first value for us, like we're all owners of our mission, is, is something that we've definitely pushed so that people don't un create unnecessary boundaries. And I also really liked your point around, I think the first version of values that we came up was very aspirational. Like it was something maybe we want to be as opposed to like more authentically us. Mm -hmm. And that's also seemed like a little bit like as the company grew, we also have a better understanding of who we are mm -hmm. authentically that sort of like shaped the final values that, that we have today. It's yeah. not final though. Final. It's like it's V2, v2 probably ever, like, ever evolving. V2. But, but, but yeah, it does feel, it, it, uh, the latest one did feel like a like something clicked where it was like, oh yeah, this actually just feels like us yeah, a little whooping. bit more. Yeah. I, I remember there were versions like, oh, that's not quite authentic mm -hmm. us. Or, yeah. Didn't stick. Yeah. Like it was on our, in a dock, but never used. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember being really frustrated on these rads, just like, why are we spending so much time on yeah. this? But, but it is, it's quite useful, I think. Yeah. And maybe one more related thing in terms of company building is recruiting. Uh, uh, maybe Ivan, one thing I've learned from you is just, at least the early days I remember, um, 
unless it was like a strong yes, it was always like a no. Uh, I think maybe one of the sayings now inside the company is when in doubt, say no. Uh, I think we cared a lot about talent density. Uh, I think you cared a lot about that in the early mm -hmm. days. And maybe, maybe you can talk, talk a little bit about that and the importance of that when you're building you know, a startup, a young company. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you're buying a shirt, if you have a doubt, unlikely you're going to wear it. In the, in the, so when you have a doubt, put it back on the shelf. Right? Going back to the... Um, Actually, like that analogy, like pushing it, like I think people just buy a lot of shirts, but I feel like you care about that. Like you care about like each shirt you're wearing mm -hmm. uh, almost to uh, an extreme version of that inside the company. Like you've cared about even today, every employee who joins here, like you review them and you sort of like go through their references. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good analogy because yeah. I think it applies to your I have, I have a shirt at home I don't wear, so it's <laughs> just don't get me wrong. <laughs> so I do have shirts I don't wear. Maybe I should return them. Yeah. Uh, but I think people join a company, the, the cost is a lot higher, right? It's like going back to the communication, each person needs to talk to every person around them. They bring their life, they bring their work, bring their opinions. It's very costly if we don't make the right fit. Uh, it's not good for notion the company, it's not good for them. So um, it's better just to hire right or part way early, right? So, um, and going back to the primitive concept, like can we have the fewer p few, the least number of pieces people working at notion, working on this problem and solve through system, through a better organization, better culture to solve the company mission, like the problem we try to solve. It's, the, it's connected, right? So we're, on one end, building a software to try to do that, building an internal process trying to do that, and the other end, can we find the right people hiring to do that? Same, similar, you know? I feel like I've been here five and a half years, and I think a lot of people ask, like, you know, what are some of the best decisions or worst decisions? And in my mind, it always ends up being people. Mm -hmm. like, it's like, you know, finding the right people have really sort of helped us come where we have. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the future. Simon, AI has been such a big part of what we've done in the last year. And I feel like you've been the person pushing for AI even before that. You, you could see it coming. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those early days? This is like maybe like a few months even before ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. you saw the wave coming. Yeah, I think. And so in, in 2019, we got a demo of uh, GPT-3. And it was, yes, super early at the time. This is before they did any of the like, um, uh, even instruction tuning, I think. So it was really just like raw language model. And <laughs> yeah, we got a demo. Like, uh, we weren't super impressed. I, I remember we were with an engineer and one of them asked, uh, um, why are there so many um, uh, Why are there so many chipmunks in uh, Colorado? And it's a you know because the government conspiracy, you know, is it, it's probably it, true. It just like completely made something <laughs> yeah. up, and we're like, oh, this, this seems like not something you can put into a product in a reliable way. So, at, at the time, I didn't think that much of it. Although I I, I started watching the space, um, and yeah, just watching it super closely, and I think yeah, beginning of twenty twenty two. We started to see the the, the image models of uh, Dolly Mid Journey, so I was playing with those a lot. Those are yeah, you got super fun. Yeah, though. those are those are so fun. I, I would just be at, up at night making like lots of variations on different things, and yeah, uh, around October twenty twenty two, um, we 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 played with a, an early version of uh, of uh, GPT four, and that and it and it really the the language part really clicked in. Then I think it it, it was pretty obvious that it was a big step change, like. It went from not really not really following instructions and knowing much to, you know, being able to follow quite complex instructions and, and having like pretty comprehensive knowledge about like everything in the world. It's kind of mm -hmm. crazy. And I remember uh, we um, we we were just on our uh, company retreat to to Cancun and we we're playing with this on our phones. The, the chat I was like, oh my gosh, this is like like better than Google. You can just yeah. ask for anything and it can follow instructions. Yeah, we uh, immediately got to work trying to figure out. Um, what we're going to do with it and like uh, started building stuff. So at this offsite, uh, you were, were there. Supposed to, <laughs> we were supposed to hang out with, with all our employees. And uh, the two of you decided to lock yourself in a room and essentially like 
get this prototype out that really sort of inspired the company mm -hmm. um, to sort of really invest in AI. Um, and um, I guess, Ivan, for you, like, how important is AI as part of our future, as the future of work? Like, how do you think about uh, what it's going to do in terms of how people will collaborate and, and do their work in the future? It's everything. It's like, at the end of the day, we're building tools, tools for solving information problems. What language model can do is it understand the information now. It can, most knowledge work, it's a piece of information come to someone, then they try to reason, think about, then find creative way to pass to another person if it's a teamwork, right? Language model can do some flavors of that. Actually, the most mundane, repetitive part right now. Um, we're building tools to help people, whatever the kind of information, knowledge related work. Um, essentially, I kind of feel kind of lucky in some way. So like spend five plus years building a text editor, spend three, four years, four or five years building a relational database. Those are fundamental primitives to shifting information around, right? Solving information problems. Then all of a sudden there's a new car engine drop in, that's language model. New type of Lego blocks drop in. It can do things in much more interesting, creative ways, have a sense of reasoning, bake into those kind of Lego bricks. Uh, I think it's completely changing how I think, how we think about product and notion. Uh, I think it deserves changing how the industry thinking about knowledge work, thinking about tools to start with. Right? Software started by solving this problem. Tech industry started by solving, for solving those problems. I believe it will change. It should change the entire tech industry. Yeah. And it is ready, yes. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, at the same time, it does feel a little bit sort of dizzying. Like, I feel like you could be on like AI Twitter and just like, it feels mm -hmm. like, I don't know, like every day it's changing so much. Like, Simon, you're on Twitter a lot. Like, how do you keep up <laughs> with like what's going on in the world of AI? Like, how do you sort of make sense of it? How do you pull the right threads to like put into the product? Yeah. Yeah, I try to stay as updated as I can with just like, what is the public frontier of knowledge on what is possible? I every time I open Twitter, I pretty much always like well, there's something see new. something. It's like oh, or it's like something. It's like oh yeah, I should I should read about that. Like I should probably know about that thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and just I think it's just continuing to stay really curious and excited about it, and trying to avoid yeah uh, avoid getting too burned out by it because it can be really really intense. So you know there will be. Maybe there's there's periods where like I use Twitter a little bit less and just kind of read books instead and then you know kind of get back into it. But yeah, it's it's only going to accelerate. So yeah, Twitter is a really important uh, uh, lifeline. Mm -hmm. It's up and down, I feel. Yeah, yeah. I think I think like right, right now, now it's, it's a, quieter. It's a little, little bit a little bit quieter right now. Yeah. yeah, and 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 a lot of things have gone kind of private. So like the labs all uh, stopped publishing. So mm -hmm. it's it's such a new feel where it's almost like you need to play. You need to like explore things a bit more. You just don't know what's gonna work. Yeah. You're like trying to come up with experiences that you know you can be like very prescriptive about what you're trying to do. Yeah. And I think it's definitely like something I've seen with our own product is like we we need to play more to sort of figure out what what might actually make it to market. Yeah, I think that's very true on the technical level too. Like, um, it definitely like, experimenting with language models highly rewards creativity and exploration. Like, it's that no one really knows how they work. So like there's just so much low hanging fruit of just like different techniques. And you can very often like have some crazy idea. It's like, I wonder if that would work. And then you can just try it that day and be like, oh wow, that actually does work. That's crazy. Um, I, I experience that like once a week probably just like, oh yeah, I wonder if that thing would work. And then, yeah, so it really rewards like just being very uh, kind of open-minded, free thinking about what's possible and just trying random stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I like the, yeah. you used the word empirical a lot in the past year. Yeah, yeah, it has to be empirical. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and also, I mean, the flip side of that is if you have an idea, you don't know if it's gonna work until you actually try it. Um, and, you know, and, 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 the, and there's also like, you can't really say anything for sure. Like, you know, does this prompting technique work? Well, I don't know, do, do you try it in that situation or not? Did it work? So, yeah, it's, yeah, it, I use that word a lot. Uh, no. <laughs> like your favorite word, empirical. It's my favorite word now. Yeah. Yeah. Empirical evidence. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm going to ask you the, uh, this. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Ivan. Describe a day in your life, maybe like your customs or rituals that you do. Uh, mm -hmm. What keeps you going? Wake up, drink the vitamin water that my mom gave me, <laughs> make another version for my fiance. So we both drink it if my mom was watching. So uh, do She's that. She's going to be happy. She's going to be happy, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Do that, exercise, take a shower, come to work. You, what did you say, come around the same time? Right? Um, then usually, like, I think we all like coming to the office every day. Yeah, uh, around the same time, usually meetings. Meeting and usually give me a ride home. Um, then I'll be back to start doing some real work, thinking, writing, uh, follow up Twitter, actually it's a good point. Then, mm. And read before I go to sleep, then the next day. On weekends, and more time to do deep work and uh, reading. And you really like fancy dinners, right? Like three-hour dinner. No, I hate fancy dinners. <laughs> burrito, it's better. No. Yeah. I feel like Ivan's always like, oh, why are we here for so long? Can we just have a burrito? Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. You like burrito, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I much prefer uh, a quick dinner. Yeah. Uh, you also, I feel like running is like you do a few times a week? A couple times a week. What about you, Simon? Hmm. Um, yeah, I wake up around the same time every day. Um, I either will exercise, I've been doing like, like more strength training, or just like hop in the shower and just, just go straight to work. And yeah, I, mornings are pretty productive for me, so I try to come to the office and just like a, a focus if I can. Uh, there's always a lot of meetings. I'm, I tend to be pretty hardcore about like not going to meetings where I don't think <laughs> I will add value or like it's important for me to be there. And yeah, I think I've, I've gotten better at that over the years. So I, I, I'll like say no to like half the meetings and then um, I'm, I'm pretty like a, a, a heads down coding every day these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah lucky, right? Lucky. He's against the arc. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're meeting it's fun. people. I, yeah. I like coding, yeah. yeah. I mean, also working with the team and going to meetings as well, but yeah. only the important ones. And then, uh, and then, yeah, come on, usually wind down at the end of the day, just like, like hanging out with my wife, uh, just like, like chit-chatting and yeah. I uh, like to go for like a long walk in the evening. And then, and I, and, and I always read in bed before I fall asleep. So it's, it's like my main reading time is just the time between I lie down in bed and I can't keep my eyes open anymore. I, but I can actually get through a lot of content. So that's, that's how I read all my books pretty much. You give me that hack, which is like get the screen uh, brightness down to... Oh, yeah. yeah, and, and, and I read on my phone. Yeah, I, I used to use a Kindle, but like I went traveling one time without it. And it's like, oh, actually, the phone is even better, like lower latency. Maybe the last question for you. If you were to write a book about what's gotten you to this point in your career, what would you title it? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I, I, I think I, yeah, I, I would call it a, a start again. So it, yeah, kind of calling back to some, some ideas where I already discussed, but yeah, I think like doing a company like this is, is a super long marathon and there's always endless new problems. And in order to last through it, you have to have the ability to every day wake up and be like, you know, what is the thing I'm going to get excited about uh, today, this week, this month? And, you know, don't, don't get too dragged down by the problems of the past. So start again every morning, every week, every month, every quarter, and keep going. Yeah. I like, and you're so good at like, wipe the whole part of that code base, throw it away a yeah. code, then rewrite Clean slate, that. yeah. Yeah, clean yeah. slate. Yeah, most people say, oh, I, I wrote this, I don't want to throw away. So I'm just right, like, rip right. it. Yeah, yeah, some of that is like, like, drop your ego and just, yeah, accept the mistake of the past. That, that can be hard, but it's a thing to aspire to. I like that. What about you, Ivan? I think for me it would be uh, perspectives. Uh, like truth is multiple folds and connecting the dots, making trade-off, you need to see different version of the truth. You need to have different perspectives. I really like this uh, quote. I think it's from Alan Kay, one of the computing pioneers. It's, um, I think it's from Alan Kay. Um, a perspective is worth 80 points of IQ or something like that, right? It's like, it's not about the, your raw intelligence, it's not about your raw CPU, it's about your taste your perspective, your outlook on things. And by consciously changing that, you can discover new solutions, making something more yeah, interesting. And then sometimes that's what creativity is. Uh, I think be self-aware of that perspective, consciously change that. It's something I, I personally I really enjoy doing. Yeah. Amazing. Start yeah. again and perspective. Yeah. Great titles. Well, both of you, thank you for making the time. 
it's an honor to work alongside both of you every day. And I think this is just so much fun to get to sit down and chat. Uh, I think we should do it again. Yeah, let's do it again. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. First Block is brought to you by Notion for Startups. We at Notion care deeply about startups and founders, and we hope these stories inspire you to keep building. To learn more about how we are supporting startups, please visit notion.com slash startups.